Issue 35. At first, the story starts out exactly like any random Joe on the street would expect a Sonic comic to be. Sonic fighting Eggman and losing his rings, and talking about wanting to get some more rings. This is a lot like the games. In fact, too much like the games. Let's make it a little more interesting, please. No, 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 not that much! Suddenly, we're expected to believe that something super special will happen to Sonic when he collects his one billionth ring. I could understand if this was the billionth ring in a row that was absorbed into his aura along with all the others still being there, since I guess that would have a magical effect to it, from magic overflow, but that's not the case. So this is very arbitrary. I guess rings have a mind of their own and have been keeping track of how many times Sonic has collected rings for, sh for shits and giggles and decided to celebrate this occasion just to toy with them. Also, why the hell was Eggman keeping track of how many rings Sonic had collected in his lifetime? And how could he? Again, the rings leave his aura when he gets hit by something. So Eggman wouldn't have been able to detect them there anymore. How could he possibly know how many rings he had collected throughout his lifetime then? Especially since I'm willing to bet the majority of rings he collected he'd get out of Eggman's sight. So how would he even know about that? Anyways, the ring decides to celebrate Sonic's one billionth ring by sending him to another dimension to meet up with an ancient walker. Because ancient walkers live in different dimensions from the one they originated from, apparently. I guess they decided this world wasn't to their liking. Oh, I guess Tails did tell everyone about his miniseries adventure and get believed by them. So why did he mention meeting authorities if he hadn't mentioned it yet, and not get reacted to by his friends at all? This Agent Walker is still nothing like the ones Tails had met, though. She looks completely different and is actually able to talk in a booming old English godlike way, so why does Sonic recognize them? So if Agent Walkers can talk, why did they have to communicate with Knuckles through pictures? Were they a different type of... were they different, like, subspecies? And if only this one can talk, then why? Why is he the only one who bothers to try to learn other languages? And how do you find out how to learn them? Do you sign up for English courses over the internet? The Ancient Walker had Sonic's ring burn, and it lifted him up really high for some reason, saying that it was arbitrarily no ordinary ring, and figures out that Sonic had gotten his billionth ring. The billionth ring saved Sonic from falling into a green sea by growing. I told you rings have a mind of their own. This is way more interesting than the games, at least. Again, it's chaos energy. It makes sense that it be chaotic. Sonic realizes that rather than being a sea of pollution, it's a sea of chaos emeralds. How did he figure that out? So, what? Liquid melted down chaos emeralds? You'd think that sea would be extremely hot then, to the point of the convection alone killing Sonic, since it must require some pretty high temperatures to keep a gemstone liquid. He meets another ancient walker, who once again is able to speak his language for once. So did this guy take English courses too? It's not like he lives with regular people, so how would he learn it? I'm glad to see that Sonic is just as tired of being jerked around this wacky zone as the audience is. Sonic is given an emerald ring, sadly without making a snarky remark about getting a marriage proposal from him, and asks if this means that the Chaos Emerald and Magic Rings are related to each other. How the fuck do you spend that long living on Mobius without knowing that? That fact of which should be everyday common knowledge by now. They're both magical, and you need 50 rings to go super with the emeralds, so it stands to reason that they're related. The Ancient Walker calls Sonic a mortal for some reason. Huh. So the Ancient Walkers aren't mortals, that's fascinating. Again, I really like this world building, you never see this in the games. Sadly, he just answers Sonic's question by giving him a riddle instead of a straight answer. Does he really have to do that? Why do all of the Ancient Walkers just want to mess with him? Do they think mortals are so inferior that being played mind games with is all they deserve? Somehow, Sonic shows that he's a lot smarter than one would think by immediately figuring out what the riddle means. He links the two rings together, creating a chain. Where did he get that other ring? Anyways, as a reward for solving the riddle, Sonic is sent into another location by a chain of rings, another cool concept. However, Sonic reminisces about how this place reminds him of Alan Cal's horizontal and vertical dimension, which I like. Some more mind screw stuff happens that briefly made me wonder if this is all a dream of Sonic's. And the ring Sonic's running on like a treadmill forms into the symbol for infinity. Good thing rings are familiar with the meaning of the infinity symbol that humans use. For some dickish reason, 
When another ancient walker says he may ask him one question, he takes Sonic's just one response as an actual question and says yes, sending him away. What a jerk! Sonic in desperation tries to comfort himself by the idea that maybe this isn't fair is the ultimate answer to every question. When he said that answer, and isn't. For example, the question of where is my TV remote would be answered by it's on my desk right in front of me, not by this isn't fair. I think Sonic's going mad from all this. But again, Sonic shows himself to be a lot smarter than colors would have you believe by figuring out what all of this lore about the rings means. The chain of rings is where magic rings go when they leave a zone. I'm guessing because rings become extremely lonely if they're separated from their buddies for too long. Though he also wonders if that's where they come from as well. Maybe it's both, like a never-ending cycle. Sonic also wonders if his universe is shaped like one strand of DNA in a huge entity because of the triple helix ring thing. I imagine it to be more like a square shape, to be honest. So that's kind of confusing. And again, another hard-to-believe invention of Eggman's. Why would Eggman be able to build a dashboard alarm that's able to alert him to Sonic re-emerging from another dimension near him before he even did it yet? It's not like he can detect his DNA because there's no DNA in his dimension to detect yet. And why does he think it's fantastic that his arch enemy is coming back? Doesn't he want him gone? The way that Sonic emerges from the portal destroys the engine of Eggman's device and sends him flying out of control after some extremely stilted dialogue where he tells the audience what's blatantly happening on the page. You know, so kids won't get confused. I don't mention that every time because it'll get repetitive and make it a lot more annoying to me when I point out so much. But seriously, that is like every issue, and even fanfictions don't make that kind of dialogue. Sonic explains that the rings surrounded him with a protective aura as he returned. Like rings always do, because they act like invincibility creators. Why are you acting like this is new? Sally's a really good friend to have believed Sonic about all this. Sure, he brought home his ring to prove it, but it looked like just any other ring. So that was nice of her. Sonic comes to the conclusion that he should find out the origin of the magic rings in Chaos Emeralds, because these things logically help him fight Eggman. Why would he need to find that out? This seems like way too big a cosmic question of Sonic of all people to try to figure out. I'd expect that from Tails, or Rotor. This is way over his head. Then again, he figured out what all the stupid riddles meant, so I take that back, I guess. And the story just ends, to be continued later on. I was expecting this story to go on for a lot longer than that. And then we get the Knuckles story continued, with Knuckles boringly pondering to himself yet again about stuff we already know. He wonders how everything that's happened to him recently could be connected to the ancient legends that surround Mount Fate. Why would they? He's really desperate for an explanation for all this. I mean, I'm sure it is true, but why couldn't it just be that this is just some random mountain? Why does it have to matter that it's Mount Fate? He remembers the tales his father had told him about the Echidna Salvation, that's a weird word to use in a Sonic comic, and how the Salvation, betrayed by arrogance, I'm gonna doubt that one, nearly destroyed the world. What, did they build a nuclear weapon? It's explained in a flashback that ever since the island was sent above the land, Echidna science has struggled to regulate the effects of the Emerald so that the island will stop floating. Huh? First of all, why wouldn't they just be able to tell the Emeralds, Hey Emeralds, let us down! If they were able to tell the Emeralds to make the island rise, naturally since they're magical artifacts and the spend to their holders will, as magic would do, then why the hell can't they use them to land the island too? This at least explains why the island continued to float for generations instead of just returning to land immediately after dodging the comic, as if it was rising out of the ground and then falling like a dribbling basketball. But I assumed that the reason they stayed above land was because of the strategic advantage of their society being isolated on a floating island, protecting them from invasions from other civilizations. Who wouldn't want that? Although I guess if they're the only civilization advanced like that, they shouldn't have to worry about that. But just because their less advanced invaders would lose the war with them doesn't undo the fact that they could still hurt people and cause significant damage. Even the ancient Mongolians still damaged China and other places despite having less advanced technology. I understand that the Echidnas would be feeling homesick for the days when their civilization was on the land like it should be. Except I don't, 
because generations have passed. You'd think they would have gotten used to it by now, and taken pride in how their floating island is so unique and special, making them unique and special. And these guys are talking as if every kid knew was wanting to return to the land for the sake of it, and the narration implied that as well. So it's not like only these few guys wanted this, which would have made a lot more sense. You'd think that spending so much time above the land would cause the people born while it was floating to not mind that it was floating. Why would they? They don't know what they're missing. It's not like they're all suffering from the high altitude causing a lack of oxygen or motion sickness from the island floating up and down like a boat in the sea because none of these echidnas look sick, and if a lack of oxygen was going to be a problem, they would have all died from the island first rising to the sky. Obviously, we had a bubble of air around the society was encapsulated for them situation here. It's not like the high altitude makes it too cold for them, either. It makes sense that the scientists and kidnaps don't want to remove the emeralds from the chaos chamber outright and cause the island to drop like stone, because that would have devastating effects on both the island and the land it would land on. Buildings on the island would rise up and tumble from the physical jerk and all that stuff. People would probably die. It wouldn't be so bad if there wasn't an entire city of people on the island here. Angel Island in the games falls in the sky all the time and nothing gets destroyed. But there are fragile buildings to worry about. So instead of appreciating the benefits of living on a cool floating island, the scientist Echidna proposes to train a device upon the emeralds that will gradually absorb their energy until the unimaginatively named Echidna Polis would be once again joined with the land, which totally won't cause an explosion from an overload of magical chaos emerald energy being absorbed by something. Seriously though, Echidna Polis? You'd think they'd name their city something else. Not exactly easy to say. Also, is it really true that every Echidna ever is living in the city? Well, to be fair, they never explicitly say that to be the case. But if that is, there's not very many Echidnas in the world. And you'd think if Echidnas were so advanced, they would have taken over a whole lot more territory and increased the population a lot more. Wait a minute, or population? Is that why they're so worried about keeping their city restricted to just one island forever? They can't expand the city much? Problem is, I'm pretty sure in a society's advance as theirs, if they wanted to return to the land, they would just get onto planes and do so. Why can't the Echidnas just start building a city back on the land, and they can just use planes to get from the island to the land? This is a pretty major plot hole. I refuse to believe they wouldn't have been able to do this. I guess they really, really care about getting their one city landing on the ground just for the sake of it, even though the people themselves can just move. This is a really fascinating concept, I'm really engaged in it, so it's a shame that it falls apart if you sneeze at it. It makes sense that the scientists get denied their plan by a judge, pointing out that tampering with the forces of nature could be dangerous. But he really should have made it more clear to them why he's saying no. Just the words explosions could have been enough. Instead, he makes the scientists have a motivation to go behind his back and do it. Also, why is this judge even here? I thought we were at a science convention between scientists. I like the dynamic between the two scientists where one of them doesn't want the other to try the plan anyways. I was impressed, I was expecting that both of them would be in on the plan at the same time. But it's annoying that Dimitri, the one who logically wanted to try the plan, says the line, Reason had to stay. It's a fun line, I guess, but you're not supposed to have characters who are supposed to be crazy and always say that they're crazy. No one would actually think that because then they would realize that they're crazy, wouldn't they? And you don't have to portray a scientist as crazy just for wanting to prove their theory is right. It's like strawmanning him. He's just being stubborn and wants to prove he's right. But this craziness comes out of nowhere as a weird character shift. He also shows that he knows there's risk from the Emerald by putting a sort of welding mask on to protect himself. As if that'd be enough. So you'd think he would know not to do this then. And if the kiddos are so advanced, why can't they just send a robot to do this instead of Dimitri doing it himself? An explosion happens when Dimitri upping the absorption rate past the siphon's tolerance level. I knew that was gonna happen! If they made the siphon, wouldn't they, wouldn't they make the tolerance level better? And it's assumed that he had died. Why wouldn't he have died? He was caught in an explosion! That would have destroyed his body, wouldn't it? It's explained that this explosion is what caused every Chaos Emerald in the Chaos Chamber except the last one to be destroyed. Sure, it's convenient that the last one was arbitrarily spared. Apparently, one Emerald is just as powerful as a huge amount of them now. 
Again, I guess they overestimated how many emeralds they'd need, considering it said that one emerald has infinite power. If one emerald has infinite power, then why can't you just go super with- Why do you need all seven Chaos Emeralds to go super? Why can't- Why can't you just go super with one emerald if one emerald is just as powerful as a huge amount of them? Also, is this supposed to be the great betrayal Knuckles was talking about? I don't see a betrayal. I see a scientist wanting to prove his theory right and help get the island back on the ground. He's not betraying anybody. He's doing what he was told not to, but it's purely to help everyone prove himself right. He's not trying to actively inconvenience anybody. So both parts of that title are false. It's not a betrayal, and it ain't great. And now we get an intriguing turn of events that I expected because there's no way they kill off a character on screen this early in the comic. Where Dimitri says that the infinite energies of 11 Chaos Emeralds howl within him, and he goes mad with power. Why? Why does he want to reshape the world or destroy it? This comes out of complete nowhere from him being a regular old scientist wanting to help his island out. I don't believe that just because he has access to all that power would change his whole damn personality. Not only not unless the Chaos Emeralds are evil and are magically making him this bait just to be dicks. You think that he would since his whole motivation in the first place was to bring the island back to the land, you think he'd use his power to bring the island back to the land. And that's it. He creates the mountain as a showing of his power, the Mount Fate. Huh? I thought it was created from the island's creation. Knuckles really wasn't clear on that last time. Heralding the fall of the Echidna civilization? So Dimitri killed everyone on the island for absolutely no reason. The end. At least Chaos and Sonic Adventure was defending some Chow. I really hope there will be more explanation than who Dimitri was before this happened or something. Because this is not a satisfying origin story for the villain. I'm happy to see a villain other than Eggman for once after over 30 issues, but this is just confusing. Issue 35 in general was an issue dedicated to world building, telling us all about cosmic lore, about how the chaos emeralds and the rings are for this first story, and explaining the demise of the Echidna Society in the second. And again, I gotta love the passion that this shows in the writers for actually caring enough to want to write stories like this flushing out of the universe. Because stuff like this is so much more rare in the games. Whenever the games introduce something to the lore, it's not really introduced because it's just for one game as a gimmick. Except, except in the Adventures games case, where it's for two. How special. The first story was written by Mike Gallagher of all people, the pun master himself. I'm impressed that he wanted to write a story about this. He seemed like the writer who took Sonic the least seriously. While I appreciate the lore and stuff, it's kind of a frustrating story at the same time because Sonic has just messed with and played mind games with the entire story just because he's immortal. And the ancient walkers suddenly know English for some reason. I guess they use Chaos Emeralds to bestow that magical energy into them to make them know it. I guess that rings have a wacky mind of their own and would celebrate Sonic getting his brilliant ring after keeping track of how many he'd gotten in life. But it still feels arbitrary, and I feel sorry for Sonic. And the second, and yes, final story was about the fall of the Echidna race, even though it doesn't actually show a fall, per se. And written entirely by Ken Penders. No way! I never would have guessed! Anyways, while I was really fascinated and engaged in all this world building, so I liked the story in general, it was rife with plot holes. You'd think the Echidnas would have advanced enough technology to have used planes to bring every Echidna back to the land. Why did they care so much about getting their city back to the land instead of appreciating the fact that they got an awesome, bitching, floating island? They could just fly back to the island, or even glide in fact, and expand their city there if they get overpopulated. Then they'd have two cities. And Dimitri makes an extremely sudden and jarring shift from a regular old scientist wanting to help the island to a destructive madman with the drop of a hat. This doesn't work as an origin because we don't know enough about him. Was he always evil and insane? He sure as hell didn't seem like it. Why would the Chaos Emeralds decide to make him become like this just for kicks? What do they have to gain from it? And we don't actually see all the Echidnas get destroyed. So, I guess they weren't? Although, if there are the Echidnas still alive after this, and Knuckles implies that the Echidnas became tree-hugging technology haters at some point, then maybe that's not really what happened. Why did they call it the Fall of the Echidna Civilization then? Wouldn't Fall mean they all die? 
In general, I love the world building in this issue, but there were a few plot holes. 